I'm delighted to be here with you to talk a little bit about the church history series. Uh, how many people have already seen some of the church history series? I'm curious. Oh, well, a lot of you still have an opportunity. Um, uh, Steve, uh, Chris Larson was uh, saying that uh, uh, this has been a monumental undertaking. When we came to the last lecture that was uh, um, taped about two weeks ago, he came out to thank the audience that was there live uh, to help us with that taping. And then he said this last lecture would be the 72nd lecture. And I suddenly felt old and tired. Um, uh, but uh, it has been a lot of fun. I think uh, people who've seen it have appreciated it, have found it insightful. And I thought I would just say a few words uh, at this time uh, to talk about that church history series. Uh, because I think it's important uh, that I make a point important to me that it is a church history series. Um, it is not a historical theology series. Now, those things are related, they're similar, they're, they're overlapping in some ways, uh, but historical theology is more a history of ideas, tracing uh, the change and development of theological ideas and reflections and convictions through the ages. Uh, church history wants to look at more than ideas, because I don't want to shock you, but Christians are not always exclusively motivated by theology. Uh, sometimes there are other factors that enter into their motivations. And so as we look at the developing history of the church, uh, we want to look at the surrounding culture. What's happening in the culture? Because Culture always makes some impact on the church. No matter how much the church may try to resist its culture, it can never escape culture altogether. So we want to look at uh, the culture that surrounds the church. We want to look at the institution of the church itself and some of the great figures in the church. Some of the most important figures in the history of the church were not um, theologians in a great and sophisticated Way. Now, I don't want to get in trouble with Ligonier either, because I know there's a recent book that says everyone's a theologian, and I, uh, I certainly agree with that. It's a great book. Everyone should buy it. Um, but uh, not everyone is a sophisticated theologian. Not everyone is a history-changing theologian. And so the study of the history of the church wants to look at great personalities that had a profound effect on the history of the church. And so that's what we're trying to do. Now, as I said, when I heard 72 lectures, I thought, obviously, I've been going on too long. And yet my, my principal feeling as we finished the series um, and I looked back on it was, it's amazing how much we left out. And um, I, I said to Chris, maybe we could uh, um, do a, a, a seventh series and entitled it Missing Bits. Um, because I constantly have people coming up to me and saying, well, did you talk about? And I have to say, no, no, we didn't, we didn't talk about this. So this is an effort pretty much to be a big picture look at the church. Um, your favorite hero may not be in the, in the series, but, but it's an effort to see what are, the, what are the big features, what are the big forces, what are the big developments that particularly have made the church in America what it is today because that's part of what I set out to do. Knowing that we couldn't do everything, even in a, in a long series, uh, I thought if, if we're aiming in a particular direction, it ought to be to help American Christians in the 21st century know something more about how we got to where we are, to be what we are, and to be able to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of American Christianity today. So that's what the aim was uh, in setting out to do, to do this series. And that's why certain things are left out that really it's indefensible to leave out, except they're not quite so important in explaining American Christianity. And uh, so that's what we're all about. Uh, the first series, as some of you will know, was on ancient church history, approximately 100 to 600. And um, then the second series was on um, the medieval Christian experience from about 600 to about 1500. So the modest task of 
um, covering 900 years of history in 12 23-minute lectures. Um, it, it, it was embarrassing, except for the fact I don't know that much about medieval history, so it was, uh, it was easier to leave things out. I, I did have this horrible experience of coming to Thomas Aquinas, one of R.C. Sproul's favorite theologians, and giving him 10 minutes. And I thought, um, if R.C. listens to this, uh, I'll be fired. It's just uh, over. Um, uh, but, but, but that's the challenge, to uh, keep moving, to, to see the movement of, of history and to uh, understand how it is relating to us. Then the third uh, series was on the Reformation, which uh, really looks at just about 100 years, from about 1500 to about 1600, that great time in which the Spirit of God raised up some of the re most remarkable uh, leaders of churches in the whole history of the church, uh, and uh, turned the church around, remade the church. And of course, for those of us who are Protestants, uh, this is a particularly important part of our, our heritage. Uh, I try to show how we as Protestants ought to feel connected to Christians in the Middle Ages, ought to feel connected to Christians in the uh, ancient church period. Uh, we're one with them in faith in many, many ways. Um, but certainly when we look at the Reformation, that great period of returning to the Bible, of really taking up the book in the hand again, and um, uh, allowing the Bible to live in the lives of the people, uh, that remade the church and uh, is such a crucial foundational moment in the history of the church that we, we lingered there. Uh, but even then, again, the, the feeling is we're, we're rushing, but we are we are moving uh, through. Uh, one of the things we note there is in the amazing providence of God, uh, one of the great technological contributions to the coming of the Reformation was the invention of the printing press. Uh, it would have been unthinkable to expect that the average Christian could have a Bible of his or her own um, without the printing press. Uh, you think how laborious it was to uh, copy out the Bible. I saw the figure once, and I'm, I'm not sure I have it clearly in mind, but I think uh, I remember reading that it took 1,200 cowhides to copy one copy of the Bible by hand. Well, that didn't happen very much. You can see how expensive uh, that undertaking was. And... Uh, the coming of the printing press enabled uh, people to have books generally, which led to a great renewal of education and learning and reading. Again, we take reading so for granted today, uh, and yet uh, the large majority of people in the Middle Ages couldn't read. Uh, but with the renewal of reading, with the uh, coming of printing, and then the printing of the Bible and the translation of the Bible into languages that common people could read, uh, all of those things came together, and, and the Spirit of God blessed those things coming together so that the Bibles could be put in the hands of Christians. And um, uh, already in the 16th century, we had a study Bible, the Geneva Study Bible, uh, which was very helpful, uh, and uh, so it's wonderful to see that great heritage continuing uh, with, through Ligonier with the Reformation a study Bible, a new revised edition uh, with notes to really help us in our understanding of Scripture and being able to hide that Word of God in our hearts. And then this fourth series that's been out a few months now uh, focuses on the 17th and 18th centuries. And um, uh, as you saw in that little clip by that old man, um, there was this uh, uh, whole new set of challenges that came to uh, the church after the Reformation. Uh, things are never static. Uh, things change, the challenges change, the issues change, and so uh, Protestant Christianity in the 17th and on the, into the 18th century had to change as well as efforts were made to come to grips with uh, a renewed Roman Catholic uh, church. Uh, one of the things in Pilgrim's Progress that I've always meant to ask Dr. Thomas about is um, uh, that interesting scene early in the uh, book when Christian comes upon two giants and uh, 
He is initially terrified. Uh, one giant is named Pope, and the other is named Pagan. And uh, he gets over his terror because he discovers that Pagan is dead, and Pope is nearly dead. And um, there's a strange sort of optimism in Bunyan at that moment that seems somewhat inexplicable. Uh, but Rome was not dead in the 17th century. It was revived, it was renewed, and it was renewed uh, both institutionally and intellectually. Uh, Rome in the early 17th century produced some great uh, theologians of its own, great defenders, uh, probably most, most notably uh, Robert Bellarmine, and it, it provided a real challenge to Protestant thinkers. How are we going to respond to this renewed um, a Roman Catholic challenge that was much more refined. Uh, when Calvin and Luther arose, uh, the Roman argument was not so refined as it became later. And so uh, new intellectual challenges uh, that had to be faced. Uh, but one of the great concerns of the 17th century, particularly in England and amongst uh, Puritans uh, and those who had a religious conviction like the Puritans, uh, Bunyan would be uh, one of the great examples of that, was if we now have Protestant churches that have reformed their worship according to the Word of God and have reformed their doctrine according to the Word of God, how do we ensure that hearts have been reformed by the Word of God? How do we avoid the great problem of formalism? Uh, formalism is the religious state where your forms and externals are right, but the heart is still dead. You can go to the church with the best doctrine and the best worship, the best everything external. You can go to the best conferences available. But that doesn't ensure that your heart has been changed, that you've been born again. And that became one of the great concerns of the Puritans in the 17th century. Not their only concern by any means, but one of their great concerns. How do we avoid formalistic religion? How can we be sure that people have really been regenerated, have really been renewed? And that became one of the great and very valuable contributions uh, that Puritanism made, and that's one of the things we talk about at some length in this uh, fourth uh, session. How do we evaluate uh, what the Puritans accomplished uh, and uh, how very indebted uh, we are to the Puritans for all of their uh, great work? And then we move on into the 18th century, where again we see um, the church changing, the church developing, uh, new circumstances. And we spend a fair amount of time in uh, that fourth series in the 18th century looking at what was going on in the American colonies. Uh, because, of course, the American colonies in the 17th and early 18th century became one of the great experimental centers of Puritanism. Uh, particularly in New England, many of the early settlers coming from England to New England were there because of religious convictions, because of their passion to be able to practice their religion faithfully according to the Word of God. Um, but they too went through this struggle with the issue of formalism. Uh, we finally have the right to not only have congregations that are reformed according to the Word of God, but have societies where the Christian vision of society is largely in place. But there too, the worry was about formalism. How can we be sure hearts are converted? And uh, one of the reactions to that profound concern was the Great Awakening of the 1740s in America. Um, one of the most dramatic periods of religious conviction uh, over five, six, seven year period that this country has ever seen. 
as one historian put it, a psychological earthquake of tremendous important uh, proportions in the life of uh, American religious experience. And uh, there was uh, dramatic conversions and a powerful emotional response uh, to preaching of, of some of the most remarkable preachers in the history of the church. Most notable amongst them was certainly George Whitfield, uh, who many have argued was uh, the greatest preacher in the history of the church. Now, we're always at a disadvantage trying to evaluate that. We don't have any videotape, and you say how old I am, any DVDs of, uh, of George Whitfield preaching or of uh, John Chrysostom preaching, uh, one of the great preachers of the ancient church period. So it's a little hard to compare Chrysostom with uh, Whitfield, but we do know that, that Whitfield was a man of amazing powers, both physically, but also spiritually uh, as a preacher. It was said that he could make himself heard to 50,000 people out of doors. Now, if you've ever tried to speak out of doors without amplification, uh, it's, it's a daunting enterprise. And uh, uh, Whitfield simply had this huge chest and huge voice that could project uh, and be heard um, far and wide. The greatest Shakespearean actor of the 18th century heard um, Whitfield uh, preach and couldn't believe his power and said, that man can reduce me to tears by pronouncing the word Mesopotamia. <laughs> uh, but of course, the, um, the important thing, I, I react like that to Sinclair Ferguson when he says verse 33. I've had a profound <laughs> spiritual experience. It's... Uh, um, um, where was I? What was I talking about? But, but of course, the important thing was not just the natural powers of uh, Whitfield as a, as a communicator, uh, but it was the, the spiritual unction with which he uh, preached, the, the, the evident power of the Holy Spirit at work within him that uh, led many, both in, uh, in Britain and in America, uh, to profound conversion. Uh, by, by hearing him. Now, it, it, it's a very interesting story. The, the, the success of Whitfield as a preacher came when he was still rather young, and uh, there's some evidence that maybe he was a little taken with himself as a youth when uh, um, someone commented about how, how powerfully his preaching was being heard in New England. Uh, he commented, Dagon falls daily before the ark. That may be a little a little uppity, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but it was actually quite true. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, probably America's greatest uh, theologian, um, uh, sat and heard Whitfield preach. Uh, Edwards himself, no slouch as a preacher, uh, certainly a, a very well-educated theologian and a very faithful pastor in his own time. And uh, uh, Edwards was recorded as sitting and simply weeping uh, as uh, Whitfield brought the message of salvation with such clarity and such power and such evident effect, um, some people in the meetings would, uh, would scream and, and fall into sobbing, and some criticized Whitfield. Uh, he said, well, I'm not aiming at that. There's no evidence of any kind of emotional manipulation in the preaching of Whitfield. He said, I'm not aiming at that. But if we allow people to weep at a funeral, noting the death of the body, why do we object so intensively at people weeping when we talk about the death of a soul? And it isn't, is it not appropriate to have an emotional reaction when we contemplate uh, the horrors of hell on the one hand and the glories of heaven secured for us in Jesus Christ on the other? So we, we have this this wonderful moment in American history, um, a moment that had such a profound impact that um, uh, much of American history from 1740 on uh, played out in terms of uh, Americans either uh, consciously or unconsciously longing for a repeat of that phenomenon. When will there be an awakening like that again? 
Uh, when will we see that kind of powerful impact uh, of the Holy Spirit? We talk about uh, in the uh, 19th century course that will be out later in, in the 19th century uh, series, the fifth series, which will be out later this year. Uh, we, we talk about the second awakening in America and how that changed American religious life in, in very profound ways. Uh, most American Protestants are more a product of the problematic elements of the Second Awakening in the 19th century than they are children of the Reformation. And so I think uh, I'd, I'd originally thought, well, we'll just do the 19th and 20th century together um, as I did the 17th and 18th century together. But as I got into it, I felt there's just so much material here that is so important to understand for us to understand who we are as uh, American Christians today that I needed to, to slow down a little bit. So we have one series on the 19th century and one series on the 20th century uh, coming up. At the end of the uh, um, series on the 18th century, I spent a little time on the Enlightenment uh, as the new intellectual challenge. Um, when Martin Luther rose on the scene, Western society was almost entirely Christian. Um, certainly, legally, the whole society was Christian with Jews just being tolerated in Western society. Um, and Luther and Calvin labored within a world where the question was not should we be Christians or not, but what kind of Christian should we be? But by the 18th century, increasingly, there are pressures in Western society and in um, Western intellectual development, uh, which was raising the question, should we be Christians? Is Christianity true? Is Christianity passe? Is there something better than Christianity? And the great movement in the latter part of the 18th century was the movement known as the Enlightenment. Uh, the very title they gave themselves sort of points to their sense of self-confidence. They are the enlightened ones. Uh, they are enlightened beyond Christianity. They've come to see all of the weaknesses of Christianity, all of the problematics of Christianity, and they're going to be able to lead Western society on to something bigger and be better than Christianity. So here too is a whole new intellectual challenge that comes to Christians in the uh, latter part of the 18th century. And the, the great symbolic moment of the Enlightenment comes with the um, French Revolution. And uh, Voltaire, one of the what might say prophets of the French Revolution had said that he longed to see the day when the last aristocrat was strangled with the entrails of the last king, uh, priest. So this is uh, against the whole old order, aristocracy, monarchy, and Christianity. And we're going to have something new. We're going to have something wonderful. We're going to have liberty and equality and fraternity. And if you don't get on the bandwagon, we'll take you to the guillotine and cut off your head. So, you know, it's, it's part of the interesting characteristic of uh, the modern post-Christian, better than Christian Western ways of thinking. I'm gonna talk about that a little more tonight in uh, my lecture on the barbarians at the gate. Uh, but already in the 18th century, Christianity is being challenged in very fundamental ways, and Christians are being forced to find new ways to try to communicate their faith, new ways to try to connect with a culture that increasingly feels that it's superior uh, to Christianity. And maybe at some point, as you go along in this series, if you look at this series on church history, you may be tempted to uh, think at certain points, boy, some of those Christians had it really good in other times. Wouldn't it have been great to live in 16th century Geneva? Not bad, except for the medicine. Um, wouldn't it have been great to live in uh, 17th century Britain in the great days of the, of the Puritan work? Um, wouldn't it have been great to be in the congregation of Luther or, or Calvin or Bunyan or um, Perkins or Ames or 
Owen. I mean, there, there, there are so many uh, glorious moments in church history. And I always remember reading uh, John Calvin's commentary on Zephaniah, I think a very neglected work. Um, uh, but early in that commentary on Zephaniah, Calvin says, uh, many people keep telling me that we are living in a golden age. And he said, that's just foolish talk. This is no golden age. Uh, the sins and needs of the people remain as great as in any age. And I always thought how wise Calvin was, not to romanticize his own time, uh, not to ignore the reality of problems in his own time. And uh, I, I think often, that I think this should be a church historian's favorite verse in the Bible, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 10, uh, where the preacher wrote, Say not, why were the former times better than these? For this is not from wisdom that you ask this. And of course, uh, what the preacher means is God has given us this time to live in. Uh, it doesn't do any good to moon about other times that we might have preferred. Um, it's the fool who wants and tries to live in a time when he doesn't live. It's the wise person who says, this is the time God has given me, and I need to make the very best use of it for him that I can. And I need to face the problems that my time has to find a way in which to communicate the truth of what God has revealed for all times. And uh, I hope that church history series will help many of you to have that sense of what are the times in which we live, how did we get here, and what resources does the history of the church give to us uh, to live in this time, to speak to this time, to pray for this time, and we hope by the blessing of God to see this time changed and made better. So I hope you'll enjoy that series. I hope it'll be a blessing, and uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you.